โสมมาสัมพุทธัสสนะโมทัสสะวะคะวะโตอะระหะโตธรรมะสัมพุทธัสสนะโมทัสสะวะคะวะโตอะระหะโตธรรมะสัมพุทธัสสะอะปารุธาเดสังอมัตสทาวรายโสดวันทาบะมุนจันทุสัตัง So this has been a very uh, wonderful day to see so many of you that I've known for so many years assemble in one place. Uh, this, uh, this, especially this place. And of course, in a, uh, this is my 28th year living in the in the UK. So you think back of when you. First came to, I first arrived in London and uh, moving into a new, a new life from spending ten years in Thailand, <clears throat> not knowing what to expect, and uh, and then when you don't know what to expect, the future then holds any any possibility from, you know, the most fantastic success to the most miserable failure. <clears throat> But fortunately, the power of Ajahn Chah's teaching was uh, this: his teaching of my man. This nothing is known; you can't know. It's the don't know, uh, rather than you know, believing and having always goals that you you create in the present to achieve in the future. Uh, reflection, ability to be aware and be present, puts you in the state of non-attachment. To any idea about the future, or any obsession around the past. So I remember when we came to Chithurst in 1979. Uh, some people thought we were, you know, it was a crazy thing to do. Uh, we didn't know any Buddhists living in West Sussex, and <laughs> and. Uh, And, and the house was an absolute wreck, you know, the Chitter's house. So, uh, but it seemed like definitely the don't know was the only way one could deal with with this mystery. And of course, 25 years uh, have passed here at Chitter's, and the result, of course, is is very pleasing. And it is a mystery. The, you know, we 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 like certitude and want guarantees about our future, and and uh, want to know if you know have certificates. Uh, because we like, you know, we we most people uh, want to know everything. They want to feel they know everything, even if they even if it is impossible. You know, a, a demagogue or some. A charismatic guru can can make you feel certain and give you assurance, uh, and and that makes us feel good, or gives a sense of security. And then then when things change and it doesn't work out that way, then we feel very distressed and upset and angry and and uh, end up uh, burning the guru. <laughs> So, um, so this uh, this the future is the unknown. It's always a a, a kind of mantra uh, in my mind, because this was drummed into me. And of course, it's a true. It's a reality. You know, when you really observe and and uh, the way things are in this present moment, you know, you can observe and and know it's like this. But even the next hour, or the next uh, half an hour, or the next day, or next month, these are we don't know. It's uncertain, and that very insecurity, that sense of insecurity, not knowing, uncertainty, 
is, is what we meditate on. We open ourselves to uncertainty, not knowing, rather than trying to have an answer for every question and a solution for every problem. Of course, in the worldly life, that sounds like being irresponsible because it's always making plans for the future and making and having all the the uh, strings tied in neat knots and and uh, trying to give this, trying to create this sense of security. Uh, our society very much longs for that. We can see it in the, uh, you know, with the elections coming up here and in the United States. Uh, Politicians want to offer certitude, you know, make people feel, if, I, if you elect me, then I can fulfill all your wishes. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality, whether it's in politics or religion or uh, this personal experience, is this uncertainty. So, like mindfulness, then, is a way to to be able to recognize that, to know, it's not a kind of blind uh, resignation to not knowing, it's, it's not a negative state, it's a very, it's a very alive state of openness and attention to the present and to, and rather than trying to always project into the present something that we want to hold on to and believe in. And of course, the most most human beings are find this quite difficult because we're conditioned in in another way. We're conditioned to to always create, to project, to to make any make everything more than what it is, to make what is simple complicated. So meditation, but is the ultimate simplicity. Uh, and then we think of it simple and it's easy, but it's not easy. <laughs> because not because it, it, it's not easy in itself, but it's because we're we're not simple. <laughs> you know, that's the if you say somebody's simple, it's usually an insult, isn't it? <clears throat> but to me, if somebody says you're so simple, Arjun, I mean, it'd be a great compliment. <laughs> and say you're very complicated, Arjun, I mean. I don't know if I like that. <laughs> and yet, on the ego level, being a complicated, fascinating personality can be quite attractive. You know, I remember when I was a layman, you know, when I was a university student, you know, I didn't want to be simple, I wanted to be kind of fascinating and complicated and neurotic. <laughs> drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes and worrying about <laughs> everything you could possibly worry about and criticize everything around you. But in uh, life here, in my monastic life here in, in uh, Britain has been a very, uh, a, bit, a very positive experience. Uh, coming from a, a rather secure situation in Thailand uh, with a very good teacher, Lung Po Cha, and, and uh, where you've got a society that's Buddhist and you've got all the, the conditions there to support monastic discipline in a certain way and, uh, and uh, you've got so many options if you don't particularly like one monastery you've got many, many others to go to. And then finding yourself in, in, uh, here in, in England uh, and not having all that, that security. And I remember moving here to Chithurst in 1979 and there were so many problems facing us because the house was a derelict house and uh, it really, you know, we moved into the house we had no other place to live, so we moved into this derelict house, which <clears throat> really, uh, you know, could have been quite dangerous because parts of it were falling down, <laughs> and uh, it was literally, you know, very uh, was filled with riddled with dry rot. And so, and then there was this this movement in in this area to try to force us out, 
to try to get rid of us because we, we are not exactly the kind of people the general population of this area would would like to have as neighbors <laughs> and so because we do look a bit strange and, and uh, <laughs> we don't quite fit into the into the, the stereotype of what a good English countryside, beautiful English countryside, what you want to see present there, you know, shaven-headed, uh, saffron-robed monks and nuns. And so there's this, this fear that, that, that we would be forced out of here and uh, remember, uh, you know, being involved in this, in these discussions and, and the, the worries about it. So, then this sense of uncertainty, you know, I began to really contemplate that how much I wanted certainty. I wanted to have everything sure. I wanted to know we, this is our property. This is our monastery. We can stay here. Uh, this is our place. And this, I could contemplate this, this, this demand uh, of me uh, that, that I was making. I want this to be our place legally and in every way and I want the council to agree to it and I want this and I want that and maybe I'm not going to get it maybe uh, maybe they'll throw us out and then then this reflection on uncertainty then immediately I began to stop creating this problem you know whether we were could stay or couldn't stay or what it seemed to be irrelevant. The practice was was always being present here and now, and and allowing for uncertainty and and welcoming it rather than than just passively, uh, you know, kind of resigning yourself to it. But it was a very active acceptance of uncertainty. So mindfulness then isn't just isn't a passive negative state of. Of, of just letting things happen because there's nothing you can do about it. That I, I would call resignation to fate, and which is a rather negative way of looking at it. But mindfulness is, is attention, full attention to the present. So like, like mountain climbing is <laughs> demands full attention to the present, doesn't it, Andrew? <laughs> And, uh, you know, this is sometimes uh, dangerous sports and situations. We have to be fully present and we become fully alive. You know, in, in rather intense situations where there's life-threatening possibilities. And you just naturally kind of awaken and be fully present because of the, the life force, the, the, the desire to stay alive and to protect your life and yet in modern life we can we, we you know most of our life isn't a, a matter of life and death isn't uh, we aren't living in situations where there's a continuous danger so we can sink into an, an endless uh, misery of wanting and complaining and desiring something we don't have and and complaining about what we have and, and this, this very habit of the mind, and this is, I think most of us, coming from a, a, a kind of middle class background in the States, which was uh, this, this kind of social conditioning was very much based on, you know, complaining about things and keeping up with the Joneses, looking at what the neighbors have and then, <coughs> and then uh, envying and wanting to to you know, keep up with them or, or get ahead. So the the materialism of the West was one that, that perpetuated this sense of always having to strive and and work hard to keep up appearances to make you feel safe and secure and acceptable in the society. The thing that that I really liked about living in in uh, Thailand as a Buddhist monk was. It, one, you kind of stepped out of that whole realm of social class structures or positioning in a society. And, and being a, 
a foreigner in Thailand, uh, you're in a, in, a, in a country that's very homogeneous. It's, it's uh, you know, most of the Thai population are Thai and Theravadan Buddhists <laughs> and their minorities, in the ethnic minorities, religious minorities are very small. And uh, so it does have this homogeneity and, and, uh, and this strong culture uh, based on and very much integrated with Buddhism. And yet, coming into the monastic system in Thailand, I found a sense of, of being, uh, you know, something, being at ease within it, being a part of it. Uh, even though I was an obvious foreigner, I could, when, you know, at first I couldn't even understand what they were talking about, couldn't understand the language. Uh, I didn't understand all the customs and all the etiquettes and, and so forth. But yet, basically, uh, there was this intuitive sense of, and this emphasis on awareness, uh, being here and now, the way it is. Now, at first, when, when Nung Pa Cha used to talk about the way it is, I wanted him to explain the way it is. He says, well, it's the way it is. Well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> because I, <laughs> this is how my mind worked, you know, and the way it is was kind of meaningless. Because I was always, my language was always used to define things or analyze things. The way I learned to use language, English language, was, was always to, to think about things and judge and criticize and compare and evaluate. <clears throat> and yet in the, in the monastery, Lung Po Cha wasn't doing that. He was using language to point at things, to, to awaken you. So that the Buddha's teachings were not kind of, you know, beautifully structured analytical teachings that that one would, uh, you know, grasp. But the way he taught was very much getting you to look at the reality of this moment, and taking the various Buddhist teachings not as something to to try to interpret life through, but pointers at reality. So. So much of the basic teaching was on this on not knowing. This emphasis in Vipassana meditation on impermanence and nicca. Uh, seeing the impermanent nature of sensory experience, of mental experience, of, of, of the uh, material world. Noticing change is something quite obvious, you know, it's, it's change isn't just a, an intellectual concept, an abstract idea. It's happening right now, so you, you don't need to, to look it up in the dictionary and memorize the definition, just awaken to the reality of change. So that was, that was quite an insight, because this was, this was my way of, of dealing with, with, um, with the thinking process and, the, and use of language was was I never really looked at it in that way, never thought of using uh, terms, terminologies, or concepts for reflection, for contemplation, for awakening. But because the habit was so strong, because that's the way we're, uh, I was educated, and the way you're brought up, and and so what, you know, you, I was very attached to, to my ideas, my opinions and views. Uh, I had, you know, ideals, very high-minded ideals. I was quite altruistic person. So, I'd, you know, I'd feel sometimes very upset or very disgruntled or confused uh, when monastic life didn't live up to my ideals of how Buddhist monks should be or Buddhist monasteries should be. So then Ajahn Chah is very good at, you know, getting me to see, you know, this is the way it is. And I think, but it shouldn't be like this, it should be, you know. <laughs> and and, he, and he, would, he wouldn't, uh, I could never intimidate him, you know, I could never kind of <laughs> wind him up in, to do something that I felt should be done. Uh, but he would actually, uh, you know, be able to, to 
point at that, that, w- that which was upset in myself, that desire uh, to, to change something, to get, some, to, make, to get something I don't have, or to get rid of the, the things that we have that I don't like. And, and so this was how he used the, the essential teaching of the Buddha when he called the Four Noble Truths. These Four Noble Truths were, were not just, uh, you know, intellectual studies and, and rationalizations, but they were pointing at the reality of this moment. And how to, how to tune into it, how to look at it, ways of looking at this moment that I would never have discovered on my own in any way. You know, yeah. And so the, that the Buddhist teaching was, was really a tool, a very helpful tool that was made available to me, which I began to learn how to use for awakening, for awareness, for understanding. So by the time I uh, came to live in England, I'd had 10 years, 11 years actually, of practice. And Ajahn Chah was very much uh, into the practice. And uh, this word practice was a word you hear it all the time. In Thai they say, Batibat, which is a Pali word, Batibata, which means practice. <laughs> and, uh, in, in, you know, when I was learning Thai, you know, I'd always hear, Batibat, Batibat, Batibat. And then, and then I, you know, I began to hear this word over and over and then I, and of course, translating it into the English word practice. And this is what appealed to me was, well, I wasn't, interest, I wasn't interested in trying to know more about Buddhism, uh, you know, and trying to, to figure it out and learn all about the different schools and varieties and, and its history and all that, even though I found that interesting. It wasn't that I didn't find that interesting, but I knew that I could learn all that and still be just as miserable. <laughs> and I could, you know, I could, you know, I could read about the Four Noble Truths and be inspired by it and still be just as miserable. Uh, so then the Batibat was, was obviously the way. It's put it into practice, make it work. And that was through awareness, not through, through grasping or or through uh, just emulating uh, Ajahn Chah, but through uh, really taking that, awake, learning what awakeness is. Awakeness is alive. You know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's where you're really with the present. And, and it's fully conscious, and it's not clouded with a lot of, of uh, negative perception. And when these negative perceptions arise and, and so forth, as you trust in this awakeness, this awareness, then more and more you become aware of how things move through your consciousness, your habit patterns, the way you tend to think or your emotional habits become, uh, become conscious. When you allow these conditions into consciousness and you're aware, because in that allowing things to be what they are, then they arise and they cease. And that's through, through uh, our conscious experience in the present. So we, we're aware of the arising and the cessation. So, in exploring this and in practicing this, the, I found at first, you know, I, I would have insight, and then I'd easily fall back into the old habits, because the, the old habits of my personality, my emotional habits and views and opinions were, were much stronger than my awareness. So I remember, you know, feeling when I was, uh, uh, you know, ordained and, and, and I was having insight into, the, into Dhamma, <clears throat> sometimes feeling despair because, you know, I would have insight, I could see, and then and I'd be fall right back into the old pattern of thinking and negative thinking or complaining or feeling sorry for myself or whatever, getting angry or upset over little things. <clears throat> but then through that pursuit of this Nung Po Chao's emphasis on practice, 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 uh, 
And then the, 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 the way, the function of monastic life, the way monastic life is, the structure and its, its lifestyle gives one, you know, this, this support of, for awareness. So, say, a Buddhist monastery is really a place where awareness is, it, it doesn't mean that awareness isn't possible outside the monastery, but this is the real purpose of this monastery, chitters. is a, to, to develop, to recognize awareness, to appreciate it, to develop it, to trust it. And so, and, and so that, let's say, a monastery like this, this is its, its purpose, its function in this society here in uh, England. It's, uh, you know, this, and so, but yet we can forget ourselves easily in a monastery and get, you know, get carried away with so many personal things, personal views and opinions and, you know, the way monks and nuns and people live together. We affect each other uh, personally quite a lot. So there's a lot of personal conflict. And that, that personal conflict can become the kind of, the obsession of the mind, trying to resolve all the personal conflict, trying to iron out all the wrinkles, trying to make everybody happy, everybody, you know, trying to, uh, that we've got this idea that Buddhist monasteries should be peaceful and compassionate places where we can live in, and feel safe and secure and, and, and then we can, once we feel safe and secure and accepted and loved, then we can really practice. But I don't see it like that because it's a moral base. You know, every, we, there's a standard of moral commitment uh, within the monastic code and within the, the lay people's code. And this, this morality is a commitment to nonviolence, to honesty, to being responsible on the level of action and speech. So this is, uh, this is the basis of, that we can at least agree to. You know, whether we can make it happen like that all the time, but this is the agreement uh, that, that human beings can make. We can agree on moral principles, moral precepts, that we're going to respect these precepts in order that we can live together in, in a way that, that we can deal with the personal uh, problems and difficulties between, uh, uh, the, on the personal level. But in a, in a monastery, then the, what I've always tried to do is, is keep this, 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 this practice as the, as the emphasis. Uh, that, the, that, that, this, that our life within the monastic system isn't just to, you know, to not, we're not trying to live a lifestyle for our own kind of happiness and benefit and, and that, but for awareness, how to use the monastic form, the monastery itself for awareness. How to use this Dharma hall for awareness. This monastery, uh, Chitter's Buddhist monastery for awareness. So that we can, you know, rather than just getting attached and clinging and, and, and just, uh, uh, or getting caught up in, in liking or disliking or being critical of it and whatnot, really using our time here, our experience here, for observing that. Because like any place in any community, it goes through various cycles of where, of inspiration, desperation, uh, everybody's in harmony and everybody out of harmony. Then you can't sustain it, you can't create a monastery or, or a society, or a family, or anything uh, where it's just harmonious all the time and everybody loves each other endlessly, you know, without any disruption. I mean, that's an ideal. That's the ideal. But that's not the way things are. So, noticing, that one time I remember at Wat Ba Pong, Lung Po Cha's monastery in Thailand, you know, there was, I remember, uh, uh, there was a monk there that, that I thought was a real troublemaker. And, uh, and he had a very loud voice. And he was junior to me, but he was always 
he always had opinions and views and and uh, and would um, and wherever he went you'd hear his voice in the in the in the eating hall he, he had always his voice and he was always talking to everybody and 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 he had strong views and opinions and he didn't like westerners very well <laughs> so so I kept hearing the word for the, what they call foreigners in Thais, Farang. I kept hearing this, this word, Farang, but it was uh, used in a, like contempt, uh, in, a, in a way of contempt, you know. And so I began to feel really indignant, you know, this Farang. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, I thought, this, you know, Ajahn Chah shouldn't allow this monk in this monastery. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to get very righteous. I'm quite capable of being very righteous. And so, uh, he, you know, and he, uh, I began to think about him a lot and, and develop an increasing amount of aversion to this monk. And, uh, and then, uh, at the time, there was an increasing amount of Westerners coming to the monastery. And, and, I, was, and I was the most senior Western bhikkhu, uh, and so I, I had to take responsibility for all of them. And some of them were, you know, a lot of hippies at that time were drifting into Wapapo. And these were, you know, Westerners from, from Europe, America, Australia, kind of drifting around and enter a Buddhist monastery that's very kind of orthodox and strict in its discipline. And Thai monastic discipline and Thai monastic etiquette is very refined, quite, you know, it's, it's, it's a, they have a very high level of etiquette in their monastic, in their monasteries. And of course, most of us, most Westerners, especially the hippie generation, totally lack that sense of good manners and etiquette. <laughs> so so I, I was supposed to kind of inform them, and, and I resented this, you know, having to go around correcting them and, and telling them how to do things. And, and then when, when I kept hearing this monk uh, using the word farang in such a contemptuous way, I, I went on a campaign against him. <laughs> and, uh, which I regret. <laughs> but, but anyway, the, the, uh, the result was... Uh, was not very good, but I did have an insight. I did have an insight because when I really addressed this, you know, my feelings to Lung Po Cha, and 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 you know, I thought he wasn't aware. I thought you know, Lung Po Cha doesn't know this. You know, he doesn't know what's going on, and and I thought I do, and he doesn't. So I I went to him one day and and told him what what had happened to his monastery. You know, I said it used to be a very good monastery. <laughs> <laughs> Not very good now, and uh, he he uh, he said, "But that's the way it is," <laughs> and and that baffled me because I, I thought, but it shouldn't be like this, you know. You've got it's your responsibility to make it into what it was because several years ago it was much better than this. Let's try to make it like it was, which I, you know I think was much better, and and but he wouldn't you know, accept that. And he was just saying, this is the way it is. He was pointing to the, the, the way it is with me, or the way it is externally, but in this moment, this is the way it is. And that kind of openness and receptivity to the way it is, because I could actually, you know, see my own, recognize this, this feeling of my, you know, I, I didn't want it to be like this. I had an idea of what I wanted it to be. And I could see what I was doing. I was actually creating this conflict in my mind. And then in terms of a monastery, you know, one can idealize a monastery where, you know, all the monks are living in harmony and everything's fair and equal and, and they're all strict with the rules and everybody's practicing hard and nobody's, uh, you know, taking advantage. Everybody's rowing together. Doing that. This is the ideal, ideal you know, one has of a Buddhist monastery. But that's not the way it is. Sometimes, <laughs> it, sometimes, at moments, 
it, it's like that. But you to sustain that. Because, uh, you, you know, with the Buddhist teachings, you're reflecting on the way things are, that each one of us is working out our karma in our own way. You know, and so, you know, the, the conceit of thinking that, that you should work out your karma like I do. You know, that's, that's what I call conceit, isn't it? <laughs> that I, I'm doing it the right way and you should do it exactly like I'm doing it. And yet, that, that kind of assumption was, quite, was not uncommon in my early years. You know, wanting everybody to do it the way I do, or, or think that the way I'm doing it is, uh, is the right way. And if they, if they aren't doing it like that, then they should. And just observing this, this way of thinking, this way of, this, this uh, conceit, uh, this arrogance, uh, observing it, not, not even criticizing, it's not fa a fact of even criticizing arrogance, but recognizing the reality of conceit is like this. So that, that self-conceit and arrogance is then consciously seen rather than, than judged as something like, you know, because ideally I don't want to be arrogant or conceited. You know, as an ideal, I don't want to, nobody, you know, the idea of a arrogant and conceited Buddhist monk is uh, <laughs> not attractive, you know. So we, you know, we don't, we don't want to be arrogant and conceited. So when we are, when we're experiencing these mental states, then we can feel very guilty and, and, and feel very uh, critical of ourselves because we think well, I'm too conceited and I'm too arrogant and I shouldn't be. But with awareness, awareness isn't a critical function of the mind. Awareness is, is not interested in the quality of anything, like if it's good or bad or pleasant or painful. It's aware of the way it is. It's discerning, it's ability to know. It's like this, conditioned phenomena. That's why you're, you're contemplating impermanence because conditioned phenomena, whether it's pleasant or painful, right or wrong, gross or subtle, is, it, it, its nature is always this flux and movement, this change. Learning to trust that awareness then is the way out of suffering, the way to recognize non-suffering. Now to recognize non-suffering, then we think of if, well, you have a, I still have a physical body, and then they say, do you, do you still experience physical pain and hunger, and, and uh, I, have, I have arthritic feet, you know, and I have, uh, <laughs> getting old, and and I'm not so, uh, uh, you know, supple anymore. <laughs> and uh, so that the body is then, you know, still is experiencing the, the problems of age, old age. But uh, in terms of suffering, is that suffering? Is old age suffering? Is old, get up an old body, is that a stiff body, our arthritic feet, is that suffering? Is that pain in my feet? Is that suffering? Or what is the suffering? What is non-suffering if I still have pain in my feet? And then I can begin, just by reflecting, I begin to see the suffering the Buddha is pointing at in, the, in those noble truths is the suffering I create around the feet. The feet are what they are, you know. Arthritic feet are like this and they feel like this the way they are. And so it doesn't change the, the feet, you know, into not feeling pain. But it, it, it means that I stop creating a problem about it. I stop hating it or reacting against it or trying to, you know, always complain or worry and, uh, or make it into some kind of problem for myself. It doesn't mean I don't try to, uh, you know, relieve the pain if it's possible, but uh, it, you know, it doesn't uh, preclude you from doing anything about it. But it's, it's recognizing the difference between the way things are and what, what we are used to project onto the way it is. Now you even see, just like even naming something is a projection. You know, people 
we tend to believe our our definitions and our names for things more than the reality of, of the real of the real thing. So we, we live in a world of ideas and perceptions, grasping these and, and then our minds are conditioned to criticize and say this is better than that, and this is right and wrong, good and bad. That's the thinking faculty. That's the critical faculty. Like uh, our, our rational mind is, is, is quite good at that. You know, it knows this is bigger and that's smaller and this is better and that's worse and, and uh, this is right and this is wrong. Panya, or wisdom, the discerning ability, isn't critical. It's not saying how things should be or comparing one thing with another, but it's observing the way it is. It's an alert state, attention, fully with the present, with the, with the pain in the feet. If I'm really with the pain in, the, in my foot, really with it, then I don't create suffering over that. I don't compound the actual experience with, uh, with a, a desire to get rid of it. Uh, apply that also just to, to uh, you know, like, like uh, emotional experiences. Emotional uh, habits are very personal, aren't they? Very, you, one so used to identify with, with emotions and judging emotional habits. And yet, Awareness is a, includes the emotion. One can, the anger can arise. With awareness, you know anger is like this. Anger is something that arises and ceases. With awareness, it, it, it receives anger and, and, and discerns it, knows it's like this. It's not saying you should... Uh, Panya or wisdom isn't saying you should never be angry. A anger is bad or, you know, you're a bad monk because you're angry. But the, the wisdom faculty knows anger, what we call anger, this experience is like this, it is the way. So your, your relationship to it is fully receiving it, noticing and, not, and, and, and letting it be what it is because its nature is to cease. So this, this reality of cessation is to be recognized, realized, and appreciated. So that we find our true nature is not, we're not conditioned, we're not the physical body, I'm not the body, or the emotional habits, or the thoughts or memories, emotions. These, these, are, these conditions arise, they, they become conscious due to conditions that, uh, that make these things possible. But the refuge is in the awareness, this, this ability we all have to be fully present. So it's, uh, you know, like, I don't know how Ajahn Sajito feels right now, having this sense of completion of this beautiful building. I know at uh, Amravati, when we had the, the celebration for the Amravati temple on July the 4th, 1999, uh, Suddenly I realized, uh, you know, I've actually finished something, you know, it's finished. Amaravati's finished, you know, and uh, I've been so involved in building monasteries since, since the beginning, you know, even, even in, when I was with Lumpur Cha, we were always building something. And, uh, and then Wat Anacha, and then um, Chitters, the Amaravati, and so there's always ongoing, you know, uh, thing of establishing and building and trying to improve. And so on July the 4th, 1999, this, this wonderful sense of, it's finished. <laughs> and, uh, and then I thought, I don't, I'm not going to build anything more. <laughs> it's finished. Now that period of my life, that chapter is over. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, it's just like something completed. And, and I didn't want to to start another chapter with uh, doing the same things in the, that I did in the previous months. So, so it, anyway, just the, the physic, the sense of completion of this Dharma hall. Because Chitters, remember when we first came here, uh, it was, uh, you know, such a 
gorgeous setting that you know we were all mesmerized by the beautiful setting it's in and and we even i think we i even enjoyed the old derelict house and when i have i have very happy memories of those five years i'd spent here uh even though i wasn't happy all the time <laughs> But the memories are very, very positive. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but then it always seemed like there was more to do, you know, the coach house and building the Dhamma Hall and, and, and then more kutis and then we have the place for the nuns and then, then we couldn't expand this anymore so we had to find Amravati and then, then we had to start, I had to start over again there and, and then build this and we had to you know, renovate, refurbish, and continuously ongoing meetings and around this kind of thing. And then, uh, then the uh, uh, July the fourth, nineteen ninety-nine, finished. <laughs> and uh, and also, it's like, uh, even though it's just you know, one can say, well, it's just on the material level, but it. But also, you know, it's like it's something in me also finished at that moment. You know, the the, the sense of something more to do. This 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 habit of always seeing there's there's more to be done. I've got to do more. We have to do this, and we have to do that. Uh, and this is a kind of a kind of desire that. It goes on and on and on. So when one gets caught into that as a as a monastic, you know, it, it one just is caught into this endless movement <coughs> of of uh, going on and on. Uh, in contemplation of what suffering is and the causes of suffering and the cessation of suffering. The, the life of a monastic is getting to this simplicity of there isn't anything to do. You know, even practice, practice, practice doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> because I became compulsive about practice, practice, practice. So compulsive about practice that if I, you know, sometimes I, I didn't want to practice. I was so fed up with practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Now I feel guilty. I should be practicing, and so the the and and yet in in you know in in terms of awareness, this isn't a matter of uh, even the word practice. It's a natural state. It's learning to relax and open. It's a natural state. It's not a cultivated, refined state that that is the that leads to the way of liberation. Leads to liberation. It's what Lung Po Chao called our real home. We're just returning, recognizing where where we're at ease, where we are. You know, your home is like a place you can totally be at ease. You're totally accepted. You totally belong in your home. And so, our real home is it Chitters, Dramavati, or <laughs> awareness? And uh, this this is. Uh, the awareness, because sometimes, you know, conditions around change. Monastic uh, situations are, you know, the, an ongoing experience of change. People coming and going, ordaining, disrobing, uh, praising and blaming, uh, being inspired and being critical. But in terms of awareness, that's always, that's the refuge through that whole process of conditioned experience, which is the movement of, of the conditioned uh, world. So, just offering this uh, as a reflection for today and uh, to, to express my, my gratitude also for everybody involved in building this uh, Dharma Hall because it's 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 truly beautiful, and it's better than I ever imagined it would be. <laughs> and I've got a good imagination. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, <laughs> so it is, uh, it is something to, to enjoy and, and to see as a place, not, just, not, not to just you know, see it in terms of aesthetics, but recognize a place of stillness. I know, know like the uh, Amravati temple is, is a place, that, you know, I see it as a place of stillness, even though stillness doesn't depend on a place. But yet, because it is, you know, it has, I, I put that perception onto it, so that when, you know, when one goes in, you see, you, you just feel this sense of stillness, because it, it is, you know, in terms of, of a condition, con as a convention, it's a place for stillness. So I, I recommend uh, here, see, in this, this Dharma hall, the place of stillness and awareness, of relaxation, of being at ease with yourself. Not a place where you've got to practice, 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 and get rid of all your defilements, but as a place where you can open and, and open to life and, and be fully with the moment, because it has the ambience, the the, the character that, that, that reminds us of that, that supports that. So congratulate Andrew and and Nick Scott and Ajahn Fazito. Uh, and and everyone else that has helped make this possible. Uh, this uh, building possible in the the English Sangha Trust and the the um, Kunwani Lamsam, one of the uh, great supporters. Uh, she's in Thailand now. She she's was always encouraging uh, and and trying to find uh, funds for supporting the development of both Amravati and and uh, Chitters. And so there are many of these places have have drawn from all over the world uh, the support the the generosity has. It comes from all directions. And so this, this is also something quite beautiful. It, it isn't anybody's, you know, private monastery or, or it's not, uh, and one can't claim it in any way uh, on a personal level. Because it's, uh, it's a combined effort towards a skillful, with its skillful means, towards an end to help us all to trust in the Dhamma, to, to learn to, to trust ourselves, begin to, to recognize it's within us, it's learning to, to really appreciate your ability to be a fully present in, the, in, the, in this moment, and to uh, re more you recognize and recog realize that, then, then you, you really see what the path is, the path of liberation. Because it's merely that. Nothing, it's nothing more complicated than that. So I offer this as a reflection.